on Born Before 64 with Jerry Suter. And you know, Jerry, I, you, now, you're, now you're doing filming and you're doing all kinds of different things. Um, and then you retired uh, from filming, am I correct? And you started writing and getting back into your love of guns and wireless right. and right. shooting. Yeah, the, the writing all came from the fact that I got tired of lugging all that camera equipment around. And it's heavy. It's heavy. And you get and, tired of it. But the piece of paper and a pencil, you can get by very nicely with it. So Right. So how long did it take you to write? You, you've written how many books, Jerry? Fifty. Fifty books. Is 50 it an books. historian? Yeah. And right. There are histories, there are biographies, there's uh, military histories, American histories, all kinds of different types of books that we've written. And Janet has been co-author on Oh, that's quite a wonderful. Few of them. Now, yeah. what about this one? Has she co-authored this one no. with you? No, uh, this one was all mine. It was all you. Yeah. Now, you know, there are some things in here that I'm very excited about. Okay. Because there are myths about certain people. Like, for instance, George Washington. He authorized bugshot musket loads. Well, yeah. He found out that his troops, really, those wonderful, flitty-eyed Minutemen of Lexington and Concord, right. couldn't hit the ground with their hat when it came to shooting a musket because at 100 yards, you couldn't be guarantee you're going to be able to hit a target as big as a standing man. They were that inaccurate, the guns were, and that. So he said, okay, if we're, we can't, and they didn't know how to use a bayonet, and so we've got to do something to counteract the, the British. And so he authorized what they called buck and ball, which is a 69 caliber ball and five pieces of 40 caliber uh, buckshot that he stuck in the, uh, the, in the cartridge that poured in. And the British considered that a war crime. Because, really? Oh, yeah. Every time you fadoon and that thing goes off, and uh, they would catch uh, American troops that had these sl shells with them. Uh -huh. They'd just give them the bayonet. They wouldn't even try him or take him back as a prisoner. It, but they just kill him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was. It was. It was. It's uh, kind of bloody war. Like war crimes, like right. using gas or something. Now Andrew Jackson didn't even know the war was over. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. The War of 1812, the Battle of New Orleans, was fought uh, after the war. The Treaty of Ghent was signed over in Paris. Uh, and it had been taken care of Ghent, Belgium, rather. Right. It had been done, and, uh, but they hadn't gotten the word when the British landed outside of New Orleans, and the Americans sat there behind cotton bales, and hardly any British soldiers ever even saw any of the Americans because they were so well entrenched, and they just shot the dickens out of those uh, out of the British soldiers, and uh, won the one battle we won in the whole War of 1812, the, the most major one, was that one, and really? then Admiral Perry up in the Great Lakes. Those were it. That, that, we, were, we were getting the socks knocked off of us in that war. Wow. And everybody just kind of gave up and went home. Uh, we didn't win it as much as the British just got tired of expending capital and uh, blood and the thing. And it was the same as the revolution. But anyway, yeah, those are the kind of little things you find out when you go into history about guns, especially in the United States. Uh, the cowboy myth, for instance. Billy the Kid. Let's talk about him for a oh, minute. Oh, yeah. Billy the Kid, the left-handed gun. Well, the picture of Billy the Kid, of course, it was a tintype. And when those print, they print backwards. So, so he looked right-handed. Yeah, he was, he was just an ordinary right-handed guy. But it's, he looks left-handed because the gun's on the other side when you print it backwards. Wow. Eh. So that's history has made funnier mistakes right. than that. Right. And so what's the most exciting thing as a historian, that you found out about the American gun and, and rifle uh, lore? Well, the most interesting part I found was that almost all of the progress of uh, guns, front starting out with uh, uh, right after the War of 1812, and we suddenly got into be able to have mass production. See, guns were all made one at a time, right. or to fit by the English standards in those days. Pieces right. were made in bits and pieces. Once you started with an assembly line and you could make lots and lots of guns uh, cheaply, war and battles and the military drove technology. Okay. And that went all the way through the Civil War with the muzzle-loading muskets and that and finally muzzle-loading rifles at the end of the Civil War. And finally, near the end of the Civil War, the rapid-fire cartridge right. rifles and pistols came along 
the gun manufacturers knew the only money, the money they'd make is selling to the military. And that shaped the whole gun theory of, of marketing that came after that. And that has come down to today, all the way through to today's period of time, that uh, military uh, use of weapons has scaled down to civilian versions of what those military weapons are. And it's, it's been interesting to see how that happened. The Henry rifle was invented for the for the military, that was like the Winchester. Right, the and Winchester. Then that became the Winchester, and then the hunting Winchester. Right. Yeah. So anyway, this it, happened all the way mm -hmm. through, and today we're kind of stuck with that same philosophy, with the assault rifle. And that's one of my questions there, okay. because basically there's a big thing going on right now about the assault, um, about being able to purchase it or getting it into the wrong hands or whatever. I mean, back when we first came out with the amendments, you know, yes. uh, they, I second don't think amendment. they, yeah, right, the Second Amendment, I don't think they ever fe felt or thought about an assault rifle in the future. And having the wrong kids or the wrong people having these actual weapons. I mean, I understand, you know, being, being a sportsman, I can understand that. But to have gun shops on every corner, what is your what is your opinion of that? Well, my opinion is that the, there's nothing. The assault rifle itself is what makes it valuable. Is it's cheap to manufacture? Okay. So it has like a high level of profit. That's why we have so many people all making the same, essentially the same weapon. But the uh, the problem with it is not that it's that it exists as far as it's essentially it was originally designed as a military weapon high rate of fire right and with a fully automatic uh selection on it that you could fire full auto or three rapid shots bam 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 like that uh they took that off and they made the civilian version of it where it's just single shot one at a time but you can trick it out with these 30 round and 60 round and 100 round double stack magazines and drum magazines that give you so much firepower what does a civilian need? That's my point. That? Why not, if we make the civilian version, a five round magazine is plenty. If you can't hit a deer with five rounds, you should be back at the range, learning how to shoot the darn thing. And I have a qu another question here before we, we're yeah. gonna have to leave you because okay. we're gonna have to do another show with you, Jerry, because we're running out of time. But for parents today, yeah. for kids today, you know, you see all these unfortunate things happening in schools, okay, why should they have the ability to be able to buy that and to cause the destruction that they've done today in some of these schools? That's frightening to us. Okay, first of all, the, uh, the gun itself isn't the problem. It's the parental supervision. It's kids that haven't been taught how to use it. Right. We need more rifle ranges, not less. Right. We need more places for kids to learn the tradition of sports shooting. It's a wonderful solo te solo sport, like golf or tennis. It's a kind of something that you can make into a, a lifetime of enjoyment, like I have. And that's why I've written this as a memoir, as well as the um, uh, actual part of it that says, we should have revived the tradition of sports shooting. We should have more ranges. We might even try to have a shooting league, like the National Sports League. If you use NASCAR as a model, right? that's a wonderful model to look at and say, we could build a rifle league based on the same concepts of having a place not to race your car, like those kids in the, in the backwoods of Atlanta, Georgia, right. and that right. a place to race their cars rather than running moonshine. Right. Or you, so you could have some place to go and, and team shooting and get spectators shooting to the places where spectators can watch what's going on and make it exciting right. for them. And I want to 
do the uh, do the book again, American Shooter, A Personal History of Gun Culture in the United States. And Jerry, I think this could be a real blessing for so many people and for so many parents and children because you've really taken the time to do the history of it. Thank you so much for sharing your life with us today. <laughs> and um, give your website out again and where people can buy the book. You can buy the book at Amazon. You can buy the book at uh, Barnes & Noble or just about any bookseller in the United States. And my website is www.averill1.com. And uh, I, you know, you can, if anybody wants to contact me, they can, once they're on their website, our email address is there as well. Be right. happy to talk to them. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to be with you today and to uh, experience your life with you again. <laughs> and you can watch this television show on our website or you can go on to the telostv.com network um, and see me all over the place, including YouTube. And go to, um, you can go to bornbefore64.com to see it as well. And we'll be back next time on Born Before 64. Bye.